Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Tonight, we're so pleased to welcome Carmen Boyosa in support of The Book of Eve and in conversation uh, and reading in conversation with translator Samantha Schnee. Just a quick uh, webinar overview for our attendees this evening. The chat is closed, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase the Book of Eve from Literati throughout the event. Live transcription is available on your toolbar as well using the CC icon. And you can interact with us at any time using the Q&A feature. Whenever you have a question for Carmen or Samantha, please feel free to submit it in the Q&A. And I'll read a selection of your questions at the conclusion of their reading. Um, and if you're watching us later on YouTube, you can always find links to purchase books in the description directly below me. And you can click on the typewriter icon in the bottom right corner of your screen to subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events, which will continue through 2023 once they become available on our channel. And of course, if you live in the United States, you can shop for books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to you anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning uh, or this afternoon uh, or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. Without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's authors. Carmen Bullosa is one of Mexico's leading novelists, poets, and playwrights. She has published over a dozen novels, three of which have been published by Deep Vellum in English translation. Bullosa has received numerous prizes and honors, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, also a poet, playwright, essayist, and cultural critic, Bullosa is a distinguished lecturer at City College of New York, and her books have been translated into Italian, Dutch, German, French, Portuguese, Chinese, and Russian. Other novels translated into English include Before, Heavens on Earth, and The Book of Anna. Uh, joining her this evening, Samantha Schnee is the founding editor of Words Without Borders. Her previous translation of Carmen Buyosa's Texas, The Great Theft, was shortlisted for the Penn America Translation Prize in 2015. She is the recipient of a 2023 National Endowment of the Arts Literature Fellowship to translate Buyosa's novel, El Complot de, de los Romanticos. She holds a master's in fine arts from the New School and a BA with honors from Dartmouth College, where she studied Spanish, German, and English literature. Please join me in welcoming Carmen Buyosa and Samantha Schnee into your living rooms. Hello, Samantha. Hi, Carmen. It's great to be with you this evening. It's great to be with you. I I was uh, waiting those seconds uh, to hear if you were going to start. You are the translator of this book, and I thought maybe the translator will give, will open us the door as she opened the door of the novel for all of us today. I want to do a little parenthesis. I am I teach at Macaulay Honors College at City University, New York. Years ago, I was a professor at City College, but now I am at another venue of the City University of New York, that is the Honors College, Macaulay Honors College. Only that little thing, because today I spent part of the day with my colleagues, and I don't want them to think I don't want to be with them, because I do. Well, I want to be with you too. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce the Book of Eve this evening. It was so far the most challenging work of yours that I've translated, but also the most exciting because when I started doing the translation, I had no idea where it was going to take me, even though I knew that the story of Genesis was going to be the loose structure for the novel. Um, I think every chapter there were surprising discoveries for me. For example, when Adam and Eve start and they leave the Garden of Eden, um, they have hooves and it takes them all the way down the mountain. Um, you know, that, that passage over the hard rocks actually wears away their hooves. And uh, by the time they end up at sea level, then they have feet like regular human beings. So um, there were a lot of discoveries for me 
including how you know they didn't have genitalia when they came out of Eden and those genitalia they developed um, on their journey down to earth. So maybe we could do a little reading now from the book and, and share part of that journey with the audience and then we can have a conversation about it afterwards. I love the idea. I just want to kind of, uh, it was not voluntary. There are so many things in in a writer like me that is not voluntary, but that doesn't mean it wasn't thought and it wasn't something full of sense. So it was not arbitrary that they, when they left the Eden, that way, by the way, is super boring, life on earth is pretty exciting but even everything is like being in a in a frozen non-space or space that is kind of frozen and this is the place to be at this is this is life this is where we are where we become humans and their body they they kind of make their own body because we do meaning that the human body we we appropriate or we make sense of our own body and our 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 skin uh, relates us with everything and we also learn words with that our skin and we we everything on us humans uh, is something so made out of culture and made of what we are that uh, uh, though i didn't I didn't plan, okay, let me do them with, let me do this. It was not like planning. It was like, in reality, I am, I am a writer. I'm a, I, I, I'm a poet. I'm a writer. And, and we live in this space that is the literary text that has everything has meaning. Everything has meaning and everything is challenging. And there's always something there to, to to open more doors uh, so um it, it, just that little commentary on what you fortunately started with and uh, i i had selected passage 51 samantha but what if i if we start with passage 50 it's a yeah. sip more long but that way we can read short passages and we are going to start with something that um uh, when they already have body, when her body and his body, and they are ready to have babies, some other things happen. They have been trying, by the way, to have a baby still with no luck uh, because they, they, they have understood they are not like the other beings. They are like the other beings, but they are also a little bit different because they talk. So 50. I'm going to read first in Spanish and then I'm going to let uh, Samantha should read first because she's, the book is in the, the one we are talking about today is this. And I'm going to talk, to read about this, but en, su, en un conclave decretaron que la menstruación era la manera de indicar a Adán que ahí en mi cuerpo se estaba cosechando la, la vida indicándoselo con el contrario, con algo que aparentaba ser sangre derramada y no lo era. Adán cayó en la trampa y yo me dejé llevar. El costo de la menstruación no fue el mes por mes, eso que más da, sino el parto, porque al nacimiento se le intentaría anexar, ellos, dijeron, es el cónclave entre gigantes y ángeles, ellos dijeron, el dolor. Pensaron la trama, confirmo, gigantes y ángeles, por bien de la teatralidad que daría a Adán la manera de creer que él era parte de esto. Para que él no se sintiera desplazado, Eva sufriría al parir. Él se creería privilegiado. A él no le dolía. Él ponía su parte de la semilla y la mujer ponía el dolor. ¡Qué trama tan estúpida y tan eficaz! Mala idea sobre todo. Adán ya para entonces, cargado de resentimiento, marcó a Abel con ese signo. Mientras tanto, Adán había estado perpetrando la trama de una historia nuestra que cuadrara a su sentir y decidió que había pasado lo que ustedes ya han oído contar. 
I'm now going to read chapter 50, which is a conclave of giants and angels um, have made a decision. And this is about halfway through the book. The title of this chapter is very appropriate for the Book of Eve. It's called Menstruation. At their conclave, they decided that menstruation would be the way to show Adam that my body was generating life. Showing him what appeared to be spilled blood, but wasn't. Adam fell for it, and I went along with the plan. But monthly menstruation wasn't the price paid. That's nothing. It was birth, because they decided to add pain to childbirth. I confirm that the giants and angels came up with this idea for the theatrical effect it would have on Adam, giving him a reason to believe he had played a part. To keep him from feeling irrelevant, Eve would suffer through birth, making him feel privileged. He experienced no pain at all. He gave his part of the seed, and the woman contributed her pain. What a stupid, successful conspiracy. A bad idea, most of all. Adam, brimming with resentment, left his mark on Abel. Meanwhile, Adam had been, re been reinventing our history to reflect his feelings, and he decided that what you have already heard had come to pass. 51, 51. Válgame el despropósito, decía Adán, que un él innombrable lo creó todo y que lo hizo de barro y le infundió el hálito de la vida para que disfrutara de la creación. Como Adán estaba solo, él decidió sacar a Eva de la costilla. Yo era nada más un pedazo de un señor enfadado. Y encima de eso contaba Adán. No solo él era el primero y el origen de mi persona, sino que yo, cuando comí la fruta porque esta era prohibida, por ya ve, pequé y traje a nosotros la expulsión del Edén que era paradisiaco, fabulosa mentira, que por mí se nos impuso el trabajo como un castigo, barbaridad, y el dolor en el parto, ya saben la verdad. Con su hablar Cainita, Caín decía cada que oía la arenga a Danita, pero Adán, el conocimiento es cosa buena, la vida es buena, ¿cómo puedes decir que lo que nos dio Eva es malo? Chapter 51. Adam said, Enough nonsense. Adam said that he, whose name could not be spoken, created everything. He made it all out of clay and infused it with the breath of life so that he could enjoy creation. Because Adam was alone, he decided to make Eve from a rib. I was nothing more than a part of an angry man. And furthermore, Adam said, he was not just the first and the origin of my person, but also when I ate the fruit, which was forbidden by Yahweh, I sinned, which caused our expulsion from Eden, which was paradise, a fantastic lie. Because of me, we had to work as a punishment, outrageous, and experience the pain of childbirth. You already know the truth. In his Cain way of speaking, every time Cain heard these Adamic ravings, he said, but Adam, knowledge is a good thing. Life is good. How can you say? that what Eve has given us is bad. So Sam, I think I should read in Spanish because every time I read, we lose one viewer. <laughs> I can see the nine numbers there. What's going on? You don't like Spanish. I understand maybe you don't speak Spanish, but Spanish sounds cute. I mean, more than cute. And nevertheless, I suggest we do as follows for our two small passages that we are going to read. That I read number 53 on your words in translation, and you read 54 also in English. Okay. Let's okay. see if we don't lose one more each time. <laughs> and then we are going to be in a deep philosophical problem. Or philosophical is not the word, but... So 53, the thing called Abel. Abel 
whom I immediately nicknamed the whip, grew exponentially more bitter. He lived at his father's side, staying close to the sheep, and especially to one bitch Adam had beaten into submission. That dog adored Devil. He was overprotected by both Adam and the dog. He followed them around night and day, a whiny cry baby. He had no idea how to be alone. His mother's strength had left him at birth. Adam, for his part, spoke at length with his creation, his he, and not at all with me. He tried to order me around, but as you'll agree, that's not speaking. So I ignored him. Chapter 54. Ada is born. Ada was born. I called her my delight, because that's what she was. The third I gave birth to, in the manner of the animals, but born with a clitoris. Wondrous, splendid surprise. That apple was truly a thing of wonder. Adam tried to give Ada orders, which differed greatly from the ones he gave his sons. I didn't want to allow this, but I didn't have to intervene because Ada, my delight, turned a deaf ear. Adam preached that the Lord of Armies would eliminate the Cadmonites, Perizzites, Kenites, Debusites, Hittites, Ammonites, Kenizzites. A heart filled with hate makes enemies of mere shadows and sees shadows where there are none. He fell into a kind of knowledge fog. Okay, so we gave a sip of our, our reading, just a little sip. And uh, till now, Samantha, the readings we have been having, we always read something different. I think that's fun. And the only uh, possible mistake we made is not uh, placing a challenge or doing a challenge, however you say that in English, start from the beginning and go to the end. And that would have been fun. I agree but, with you. But uh, the, the, the issue with a novel is that always a novel has, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it has a, a body, it has a, they say arc. I am not very sure it really has an arc. I mean, books really have an arc. They have a, uh, they, they are like, like in music that you feel the, the movement happening. So taking a little bit, um, it always has a, a surgical effect for the uh, writer. And I feel like, uh, like, uh, like we are taking out a rib, a piece of a rib of the <laughs> novel. And if this Eve hated the idea of being herself, a piece of the rib of, e, of, of Adam is like, like ma making an Evie night scene. Un pecado de Eva. How do you, un pecado Evanita. Eve night? Uh, I, I think you just have to make Eve into an adjective. Uh, How do you make Eve into an adjective? Well, you could say, this is something, by the way, that Carmen does a lot. In her writing, she uses neologisms with great frequency. So I often have to make up words. So I would think Eveite or Evian, but, you know, I would have to kind of play around with it and, and say it to myself in my own head before I came up with my final solution. But let's say Evian for now. Evian, take it home. The problem is that there's a brand of water that is yeah, that's like, true. And uh, Eve is everything but pure water. Eve is flesh. I mean, this Eve is like flesh, intelligence, creativity, daring adventures. Uh, uh, so yeah. I, I don't see her very Evian. <laughs> so yes. uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's a, that's a thing to think about. Evite. You can say Adamite. So I guess Evite would work too, but Evite is a problem because we have, you know, you can invite people to a party with an Evite. So there's lots of complications here that we don't need to delve into right now, but this is one of the challenges that I face when I'm translating your prose because it does have a lot of inventions, which is part of the reason it's a lot of fun to translate your work. And 
I want to say thank you for reading the Spanish part. I don't know if it was the Spanish or the menstruation that scared the other people away, but I think it's really important to have the original language, as you would say, a sip of it, because that's how it was created. And I think it has a slightly different personality in the Spanish because the Spanish language has a different personality. It sounds very different from English, even though we can convey the same meanings. So I'm really glad that you read those parts, even if it scared anyone away. Uh, I, I totally agree. The books change their personality in a way. The books, the poems, the essays, uh, because language has a, a smell. And the smell changes, but it's not only the language, it's also the translator. So... Um, and maybe in some kind of authors, the smell counts less, but I smell a lot. <laughs> I'm smelly. <laughs> I mean, I'm smelly. What can we do? So, um, in a good way, Carmen, I think if you are a smelly author, you're like a kitchen, a kitchen that's full of all of the sauces that I love from Mexican food, of mole and all the different chiles and everything else. That it, so. It's only the most delicious, delectable sense. I brought now from Yucatan that I went some weeks ago, a month ago already, time runs too fast, a bag with um, a, a species, species, if you say that way in English, from Yucatan. And it was so incredible. My grandmother that was from Tabasco, not precisely a uh, uh, Merida, but when I opened the bag arriving home, I even heard her speak. We was taking out the little uh, containers, the little bags with the, the, the powders and the, the kind of creams and things to cook. And I, I passed one after the other one and I kind of, I wouldn't say I smelled my grandmother. I would say I heard her talk. I took one and it I heard her speak and then another one and I heard her speak. And then what did I do with them? I was not going to put them in jars. It sounded like a cream. I returned them to the paper bag that I came with uh, that has a, a, a carrier like this. And I placed it in a, in a door in the kitchen. Uh, and there's that presence. And that presence, I think, is very important for the writer to have the presence of memory of its own tradition, of the of its own childhood. I think childhood is always an in, enormous resource, even though I spend so much time in in in, in the libraries and and one I've written already 19 novels. I'm struggling with number 20. Uh, even and I have written poems and essays. I'm all the time writing, but it, that that memory is an enormous resource. Yeah, and scent, smell. And I do have to say, I do have to say, I'm going to be more bojos. I'm very sorry. Now we have nine, meaning we lost one. And it, it's strange. It was not menstruation, Samantha, because talking about childhood is a space without menstruation. And even at childhood, we lost one person. So... Don't leave persons that are there. Don't leave because we put you put us to think. What made you leave? What made <laughs> you leave? What did we, Samantha thought it was that? I didn't. I thought it was the 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 abyss that is another language. So going to the novel. Yes, we'll never know. Maybe they just had to go and make dinner. Also. That Maybe they got be. hungry listening to you talk <laughs> about the spices. Yes. That's good. That's good. It's good. It's good. Um, it happens sometimes also when, when, when it, listening to words, things have a smell. Words also have a smell and they also make you hungry if yeah. it's the case. And not necessarily when you speak about food, about species, but uh, of other things too. I think somebody in the, the chat agrees with us. She said they were getting hungry. <laughs> yes, Karin is totally right, completely right. So, so what can we say of this book, Samantha? 
Well, I would like to say that, you know, I think you have a really wild imagination and that, you know, to me, not all writers have the same tools in their toolbox, right? Everyone has a different set of tools and skills and strengths. And there were some aspects of this novel that for me were almost like translating science fiction. You know what I mean? In the sense that the previous, um, books of yours that I've translated and of course all of the criticism and the screenplay and all of these were dealing with humans you know humans as as we know them and that in in the beginning you know this book is really quite um out of this world literally and and that was a lot of fun you know I, lo I loved being transported to another world that predates this world and even if it only existed in the imagination of the people who wrote the myth of Genesis thousands of years ago, you know, I think it's really important to address that myth and the misogynist and, um, you know, patriarchal pieces of that myth. And I think that that is a really important job that this novel undertakes. And, and I would love to hear you talk about that because what I see you doing in, in all of your work to some degree, whether it's greater or lesser, is essentially rewriting the canon uh, and rewriting the canon in such a way that female writers who have been excluded are given a voice and rewriting it in a way that even female characters from books from the canon itself who have been marginal characters are given their own full lives. So I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that impulse and whether it's a conscious impulse or as I suspect a much more subconscious drive that's almost like an internal engine that is just like your heart beating. You don't notice you're not doing anything to make your heart beat, but it beats nonetheless. So that's my long uh, question. Uh, well, your long question is uh, has a lot of uh, corners I could take. And uh, I, my family was so Catholic. My parents were so radical, religious, radically religious. I went to mass daily for many years. We were a missionary family. Um, it was like the center of their social life and and of many, the center of their life was in their faith, in their belief. So um, when I, as a teen and as a young writer, when I started reading about myths, myths, other kinds of myths, it was opening me doors. And it took me long to return to the stories I had heard as a kid. And I have been obs obsessed in different ways, uh, like trying to read them differently, to, to understand why they were told that way and to refigure them for me. As I think we have all refigured the birth of Venus uh, one way or other. And popular culture is all the time doing it, but also serious novels, serious writers have been doing that. And I do think it's important to not only preserve the stories that were told to us, but also give them our own eyes, turn them into something different. The case of the Eden, when I wrote the book, I started because I was kind of more than puzzled saying, oh, how come how come Eve, Eve is the first and she's so bland and she doesn't speak? And, she, and the only time she does something, she ruins the adventure for all of us. But um, recently I've been also been thinking how our, we think of the earth with so much despise in that myth, in that story, in that book, uh, in the sense that it's like if we were Edenites and earth was a punishment because that's what the story says. Earth is a punishment. So um, it's not a punishment, earth, but 
many other things that are inside the Genesis, I they puzzle me. They are always always telling a tale, telling a story. It's a way of understanding the world we are at, uh, following, let's say, the shallow shadow of reality. But at the same time, whatever you write, the literary text is a lamp, and it's a very cruel lamp that looks at reality with a very sharp eye. So what you first try to capture or reproduce, be it a tale, be part of the of history, like in the case of my novel, Texas, uh, be, whatever you, or, or things you, stories you make, uh, you write them, you're following the shadow, the form of the story, the, the body of the story, and then that turns around and, Boo! Brings you another. Everything looks different. Not only inside that story, but in real life. So yes, and I, I kind of understand why my grandmother Esther, my maternal grandmother, and that is answering a bit this question: Who are the women in your life who inspire you to write a strong feminine perspective? My grandmother Esther, who was born in 1900 as my other grandmother, Guadalupe, uh, they both would have thought it was horrible to think feminine perspective. It was outside their, their horizon. But my grandmother, Esther, the mother of my mother, she was such a feminist in so many things. She kept saying, my granddaughters, and she didn't care about the grand boys. They had it already. They were going because they were men. She, as a little girl, uh, at her home, they at her, the place where they lived, the hacienda, the ranch where she lived in Tabasco, uh, girls were forbidden of, as she said, following the ball and jumping the the row. You say jumping oh, the, the jump court. Rope. Yeah, it was forbidden for women. Girls couldn't do that. And one day she couldn't contain the idea of trying how to jump. Her brothers had been doing it, possibly also the daughters of the workers in the in the hacienda. I don't know, but she did it, and her father caught her, saw her, and she was punished in a very fierce way. They locked her in her room alone, twenty four hours, no food, no water. Uh, the punishment was enormous. Whatever she did as a as a woman, she she didn't go to school. Her brothers did. Uh, so she she was, and it was going to happen to her, as happened to my grandmother Guadalupe and her mothers and her aunts and her grandmothers. They were used to increase the patrimony. They they didn't decide whom they wanted to marry. They married them. They were objects. They were objects is a to, to a word too used. They were an extra to acquire something more. They were part of a merchandise. Uh, so. Obviously, she defending us and saying, my granddaughters, they all had to go to university, my granddaughters. And she was obsessed about that. She was a very good reader. She had learned how to read and write. She was, she had her own business. She had done herself, but she, and possibly more important, she was an as extraordinary storyteller. The mm. way she told stories was so captivating. And I spent with her so many afternoons of my early childhood while my mother attended university and, uh, and then worked and did her things. Uh, and and I, I listened to her while she was cooking, doing chocolate. Uh, she was very old fashioned in that way. She was really a serious cook and did everything from scratch. And and hearing her, but not only is not was not only that for her it was not a fight against cooking or doing girls' duties. It, it was the 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 being unable to have a whole life that she herself suffered, and she was not going to permit it on us, and she hadn't on her daughters. So it was her. My 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 most beloved. The being when I was a child, and maybe today, maybe I never learned how to 
love anybody more. Mm. And I love her. Mm. That's beautiful, Carmen. Well, I know that um, we were going to have a little bit of chat with John. It's from Literati, the, the bookstore. So do you want to come back, John? And Yes, John, I'm, I'm John. here. I feel like you, you've reached a depth of conversation that I, I feel as though I, I might... I, I might fail to return us to, but I'll 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 do my best. Um, I want I want to say something about you and your typewriter. Oh please! I already had said something before, but I really I love typewriters. I handwrite everything, but when I was a young writer, there were no computers, <laughs> and I to pl- finally have the final version of a poem or a play that I wrote plays of my first novel my second novel, I did them on typewriters. Uh, and I still have my typewriter, but it's too difficult, you know? It's a lot of work. I I tried, but I can't. My 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 fingers have become lazy. So no, I, I love the idea of you becoming a typewriter <laughs> and coming back to life. They make they do make these typewriters now too though that um that connect to you, they don't it's not like a computer where you have any other applications it's just the typing so it gives you this sort of distraction free environment and it has a nice sort of modern keyboard but it's still like a typewriter because you just see what you're typing and then you can save it and send it later for editing and stuff like that but but uh i don't know yeah someone was showing one off in the office recently you've, you've reminded me of, of, of but that. it's not the electric one it's something it's no, an inter- it's it's a, it's a fake computer it's... with the body <laughs> yes. you know, I, I hate fake i like i like conversions that i like you were you were a human when i met when we met you then you became a, a typewriter okay good the typewriter became a human Okay, good. But I don't want a typewriter at, ha- at home that is a human. I don't want that. Okay. That's yes, yeah, so that's fair. It is, it is, it is, it does seem like a, a um it's not the genuine article and it's not it's not transformative in the same way. That's right. Um well, I mean, my animating question, and this might sort of return you to to questions that you've you've um and ideas that you've already tackled in your conversation so far. But Samantha, you mentioned at the outset that this is the most d- difficult work of Carmen's that you've you've translated. And I wonder, you know, you've touched on and we've heard, uh, you know, that, that that using the book of Genesis and the sort of restructuring of the canon, I can imagine, creates these additional challenges uh, in, in translation, um, but I'm wondering what how it compares to. I mean, you've 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 translated previously um, uh, a, a novel of Carmen's, and you're you're translating one now. Um, and so, what stays the same in that process for you, and, and what what marks um, the Book of Eve as as, as more challenging uh, than than uh, El Complot, for instance, or or, or uh, the Death of Texas. So I think that for the other books that I've translated that Carmen has written, she has a very strong voice, a very powerful voice, and that stays the same. You mm. know, I can always, I always know that I'm reading Carmen. It's very distinctive prose. That said, um, the previous works I've translated, including the one that I'm working on right now, the Complot de los Romanticos, which will be called Dante Hits the Road in English, um, are all, they have uh, points of reference that I can relate to that are kind of concrete in the sense that they're characters from books that have been published that I've read, or they are fictional characters from a place that I can I visit or research. But in the case of Eden, they're really, you know, this was pure imagination of Carmen, the, the setting of the first chapters of the book. So I had no point of reference mm. for it. And, and I just had to sort of feel my way into what I think she was imagining. And thank God that at the end of that, 
I have the opportunity to share the text in translation with Carmen and say, did I get this right? Because I have no way of knowing whether or not what I'm seeing as a result of her words in Spanish is what she saw in her own head. And by the way, Carmen has an amazing novella called The Perfect Novel, which is exactly about this phenomenon in which a, a scientist who's absolutely brilliant invites, invents a chip that an author can put under their tongue that recreates a book as the author imagines it in all the senses. The, the sights, the sounds, the scents, everything is recreated exactly as it is in the mind of the author through this new technology. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another thing that I have kind of done a partial translation of that so far we haven't been able to find a publisher for because as everyone knows, it's very difficult to be published in English if you're not writing in English. Um, that's a whole other ball of wax that we probably don't need to get into tonight. But um, I think it needs to be said as often as possible that, you know, it's very difficult um, for writers who aren't working in English. And it's twice as difficult for a female writer who's not working in English as it is for a male writer. And, and that's been proven by statistics, by studies that organizations like Vita have done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's part of the reason that, you know, I think it's important to work with female authors for me personally in my own translation practice. Thank you. It reminds me too, we, we had a, a Swiss author in the store last week, uh, Dorothy uh, Elmiga, um, whose novel Out of the Sugar Factory has been translated from the German into to a number of languages, including English. And we were lucky to have the, the translator uh, into the English uh, at the German department at the University of Michigan. Um, but Dorothea was mentioning that, you know, she, she, she being able to interact with English as English is sort of like the language of the, of the world in, in some sense, or is it English that there's a language that more people have access to? But there's these, she has no idea, for instance, like what the, the Czech or the Turkish translation of her book say. Uh, and and that those those are challenges as, as well. Um, Pat has a question for, for Carmen. Um, in your novel, do Eve's ideas influence the men around her? Or does she have to exist as, quote unquote, less without giving too much away? Well, the, the big flaw that Eve has the eve of the book has is that no she doesn't leave us less at all but she's unable to incorporate adam into her adventure of maternity and enjoying life and earth so um she doesn't take any distance with him either they live together they even much to his uh, chagrin he doesn't want to leave she wants to live and also uh, he, he 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 doesn't have it all it, there are many passages where he stays quite behind or behind no aside and she doesn't know she even though she lives with him he's part of her life they are the only two um she doesn't her social uh, capability she she makes it wrong. There's nothing more difficult than the art of living and living with other. And she fails there and he's full of hatred to her. He is the one that invents the version of Eden and, and Genesis that we know. He's the one that says she was taken out of a piece of him. He thinks he doesn't, he, he invents He's so full of himself because he he doesn't want to be there, and he feels she's rushing to do so many. She's having so much fun, and he's set aside. So she, I blame her now, but not when I was writing the book, because I was listening to her. I was part of her party, but then I thought, oh, Eve, you did it wrong, or I blame her partially. I have no doubt that this Adam is third class, but there was the only one around. And she was unable to make something better of him. 
I mean, maybe it was impossible, but no, answer in short, no, no, she doesn't leave less. The problem is when violence enters her, her family and horrible things happen inside the family. We have really domestic violence, not against her, against her daughters. Uh, uh, the, the violence of, the, of hatred enters their own home. Uh, and also she 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 quits one of her sons she has for herself Cain that's the oldest one and she gives him Abel thinking that's going to make him happy and he poisons Abel and Abel starts killing the animals he's the one that brings meat to the table and he's the one that has what the father has showed him to be and it's uh, something very nasty happens there that we didn't read today. I I hope you read it. And you it's, can. It's also good to read horrible <laughs> things. There's a I won't call it innocent pleasure, but it's so it's possible. It's one of the most strong passages of the book. And you I can. Agree. It is one of the most strong passages of the book. And it answers the question that the Bible never really addresses, which is if you start with Adam and Eve, uh, how and they have Cain and Abel, and what happens after that? How do how does the earth become populated by more people? Where where who what's the parentage of those people? So yes, um, but incest itself would wouldn't have been that bad. The problem is how it happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. We have violence inserted in, in the in the family circle, and it comes all it comes all with a way of being, with thinking what's the the earth of having his idea of what a woman should be. All that, all is a, a, a language of violence. A completion of that creation myth, and then in a sense of of what's missing in our narratives is something that's foundational to to our human history that sense of of of, of the, the rootedness of of violence in our even our blood relations and domestic mm -hmm. relations yes i think that the real foundation is the relationship with uh, mm -hmm. it, it's installed in the in in the in the family in the daily life in the domestic area yeah. that disorder is not an order and it's it it's it's seeded in the in the in the family relationships that's the way you then can have if you already have half the population being your slave or there to serve you then you can have own slaves then you can that's how the way you explain in a long uh, way why uh, most of the population live only to to serve more than half the, much less than half of the population three percent owns all and all the rest have nothing and that is normal that is moral that's what it is no it's not what it is but it it had to be it it, it was it is seeded in the domestic in the daily in 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 there and well that's what the novel is about i was joking about the novel here with samantha maybe um i was a bit distracted but it's not a frivolous book it's a book that talks about uh things that are very serious mm -hmm. um i just want to ask one one last question i think before i think we have time for one last question and that's to, to return to my question to Samantha and to and to sort of dovetail off Samantha's answer of of having the the ability to 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 share your imagination that that generated this novel back to you in English um, and make sure that it was grounded in, in what was there. I imagine for you, Carmen, that there's there is this potentially competing sense of both these ahas of seeing the work return to you in this way correctly, but at the same time, perhaps in new ways that, I mean, this is always, I feel like I'm always asking this of, of, of authors and their works in translation, that something new happens in that process. And this is not to get too close to theory of translation, but I wonder what that's like for you to sort of recognize stuff that that is new, that you're sort of willing to let be new and separate 
and what is important to you to sort of keep as 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 a sort of core meaning or 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 you know not like the semantic level but the the spirit of the text i wonder if it's both that there's some things are are need to be right and some things are are open to sort of being transformed maybe that question makes no sense <laughs> no no the question makes a lot of sense um I think the translator is also a writer. The right. translator translates writing, needs to write. And language is something pretty tricky. So obviously, a translated book is not the same book. That's absolutely obvious. Um, and obviously, the author can feel irritated or unhappy mm. but with Samantha I feel happy and not irritated and it's a matter of uh, taste and uh, feeling and I feel comfortable and happy more than comfortable comfortable is a, a, a pale word mm. I feel happy with Samantha's work um, I also know, and I have noticed, and Samantha knows I have noticed, sometimes she hits it perfectly. The book that she first started of mine, that she did publish, Words Without Borders, that I admire too, uh, published a fragment of uh, La Novela Perfecta, the perfect novel, and it was for me even magical because she got it and it's a very difficult book because it's a Mexican slang and it's an incredibly nasty character a male and he's a good for nothing he had written a bestseller by chance many years ago and then he married a gringa and he lives doing nothing <laughs> saying he's going to write the next book and he just doesn't have it he's not a writer he's uh he's an opportunistic prick and uh and but speaks like charmingly because you know the words, the way they play, and the rest in daily life. Uh, and Samantha got it and got the rhythm and got everything. And I was pretty surprised mm. because uh, it was difficult. Now, Eve is difficult, but I think Texas, I defer there with Samantha. I think Texas is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. is a hell of a novel is it's it has 360 characters uh, the plot is incredibly difficult assembled with so much it's like a puzzle made with many parts to tell a historical passage and to retell the story of the border when the USA stole Los Texas among other parts all that is told in a way even the cows speak which is doesn't happen to be realistic, uh, and and we have uh, uh, communities of only women, kind of Amazons there in the middle with their own ranch, cowboy girls, and it's it's a it's a very crazy, very difficult novel, um, and she did it, and with Eve she did it, and Eve is very different also mm -hmm. because though we have like the story of humanity rushing it doesn't rush the book the book has a peculiar pace and samantha got the 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 rhythm so what can i say that i'm lucky except that i'm lucky i am um, too <laughs> i think that's a beautiful note to end on uh, no better endorsement than the than the translation than from the author themselves um and you can purchase the book of eve from literati bookstore there's links in, in the chat there's also links below if you're watching us later and, and karin um, karin says i love the cover i just ordered it i also love the cover it's an incredible cover they got it the cover is fantastic it's wonderful. Um, well, uh, I hope we can have you both uh, in the bookstore um, in the not too distant future, perhaps uh, for this next translation. Uh, Carmen Buyosa, Samantha Schnee, thank you so much for joining us this evening at, at Home with Literati. Um, and to our viewers, we hope to see you again 
at our next event. And Carmen, safe travels. Uh, you were telling me about uh, your very busy schedule in weeks to come. Um, so, so safe travels to you. Uh, and I hope you get a rest at the other side of it all. Uh, and thanks again to you both. And uh, take care all. Have a great night. Thanks, John.